I'm going to begin. I, the gentleman doesn't need any introduction, and because he's a very warm, illustrious person, and we all know him, and we love him, and we're glad that he's here to share with us <laughs> history of Attleboro. So I'm just not going to say no further introduction, Mr. Larry Fitton. Hey, 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 hey. All ye curious people here to see what an illustrious ubiquitous person looks like. Not bad. I don't know, even know what that means. Well, the subject is where we are. We are in front of the academy building that was one of the higher learning schools in Attleboro, a private school. And among the things they learned was Latin. Now, Latin is something you can't get along without in Attleboro. We all know that. And as we look around where we are, this used to be, as you can see, we're on the top of a hill. And this hill extended over to almost all the parking lot. And when Cyril K. Brennan was the mayor, he had all this removed down to a level to create a parking lot, and it was carried over to make Riverbank Road. Hardly a man is now alive. I have seen Riverbank Road when it was flooded so you could row a boat across it, right out to the mm, whole, what's the name of the street? Holden Street? No. Well, big as well, F anyway. Hodges, like F Hodges. <laughs> it was Frank Hodges. That's <laughs> anyway, uh, it was quite a thing. And I drove my car from County Street across, and I didn't know whether I would make it all the way because the water was so high above the axle of the car. And, and what a fool. I do fool things. I got out in the middle of it and wondered, suppose I stopped right here. But I didn't. I didn't drown either. The uh, many times the river, Ten Mile River, has flooded. They call it the Hundred Mile Flood, and uh, it, it floods right over County Street Bridge. Now I, at one time, rode a kayak on Washington's birthday from Hodges Street to Wall Street and under the bridge. And that bridge had uh, the original colony of spiders. <laughs> they had been here that long. <laughs> Come through the spiders. And Henry Brosso was the health agent. And he had me set up to test the, the uh, acid going from the factories into the river. And I found other things more than factories that uh, were established when they knew what to do with their sewage in an easy way out into the river. And I had a device that I made that was like scissors, you know, and you squeeze it like this and it goes out, maybe about eight feet. And I had a rig on the end of it so I could get a little bottle out under the drippings from some of the pipes from the, the factories. And some of the pipes were probably up about eight or ten feet. And naturally, in February, isn't that when, uh, when the time of Washington's birthday? Yeah, he was born in February. The wind would blow that acid drip toward me, you know, and I was far enough away. And Henry Brusso, on his own, tested all the acidity and waste that went into the river and made a report of it way back when. The Indians were here. The Indians were here, and naturally they came to the high land. Because being on the high land, they could see the people from North Alabama coming in, you know, to take over. And uh, that being the case, it was a smart thing to do. And the Indians were smart 
or they would starve to death. Now you've heard of Massasoit. He was the, the chief, uh, the sachem of the Wampanoag Indians. <clears throat> and uh, Thomas Willett was one of the people that did business with the Indians because he was friendly with the Indians. Some people are and some people are not. And uh, the proprietors, as they call themselves, the first settlers, just came in and settled on the land that it was there for the taking. But then it was decided that they should purchase this land from the Indians. So what did they do but bring a bunch of beads and some blankets and a few um, oh, maybe knives and a hatchet or two. And Wamsada was no dummy or he wouldn't have been the chief. So he knew these white guys are up to something. And it looks like they want to give me gifts. So uh, I better play along with their game. And uh, they said, the chief, chief Sachem in Plymouth has sent us here to do business with you to purchase land. Now, Wamsada didn't know anything about purchase or sale or, or even who owned what. I, I just come here, uh, says uh, the chief, in the winter time where it's better to survive in the woods than it is out on the shore of Narragansett Bay. And in the summertime, I'll go back to Narragansett Bay like the people do today. And uh, knowing that they were up to something, he said to the Thomas Willett and company, do you white veil face have anyone like me, you know, big chief? And they had to stop and think, well, there was Alexander, Alexander the Great, like you chief, great. <laughs> uh, you know, this really happened. And uh, <laughs> I was there. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> they said, uh, Alexander the Great, and they said, we want you to sign your name on this paper that will turn that land over to us. Well, they you to sign your name. I like the name Alexander. Don't call me Wamsutter anymore. Call me Alexander. Now, how do you spell that? Because i got to sign it on your deed here. So they thought, what's an easy way, right away, because they're smart thinkers, use the, the uh, symbols of the Greek letters, Alpha, Lambda, Chi. And that came close enough to Alex. So what does he do but scratch his initial on the deed that still is in existence, but the Indians, as they would change their name at will, they would also add a few more characters to the name to make it more important. So they might put an A at the beginning and an A at the end. And if the lambda fit better this way than this way, then <laughs> stick it in like that. And you'll find that that's the way the, the deed was signed. Now, George Nurney was quite a man on his own. And he was an artist. <coughs> and he worked for the Bay State Optical Company over on Pine Street that now is the housing for the elderly. And he designed the seal for the city of Attleboro. And he, it was Morris Robbins, who was the head of the archeological uh, group in Attleboro for 50 years they used the bank top floor without paying rent, but the city gave the bank a little break on the taxes for doing that and allowing the museum to exist there. And there was an argument between the two of them as to how the, the Greek letters were supposed to be, and they never could come to agreement. But we're happy with the way it is because it makes a very interesting seal. The first seal that was had by the town of Attleboro was a picture of the old locomotive with smoke coming out of it, coming through the center. 
And at that time, it was on grade and not above grade, as you see it today. And it also showed uh, the, the weed, I believe, that showed the, the industry of agriculture at that time. Now, interesting enough, the Holman family had their estate across from the Alabama. And in that home, there were two ladies that were related to the family. And they had right of residence as long as they lived. And in those days, when you got to be my age, instead of putting up with you, they sent you over to Taunton in an institution. <laughs> And, and had to keep that place that uh, was on the, the corner of Pleasant and Holman, Maury, and Emory Street. And interesting enough, Holman, uh, Emory, and Maury are all named after individuals in the Holman family. Now, my relationship to Holman was down 16 Brook Street, where it wasn't such a move from the center of town. And when the settlers first came to town, they went to a place that was cleared of trees. Because naturally, if you find a place that's, that's in the location you'd like to live, uh, you would take the place where you didn't have to cut the trees down. And the houses around the center that we call the center now had residents. And uh, we, we, we call Dr. Uh, Bronson. That Bronson building was where Dr. Bronson was, uh, had his residence. And uh, when the doctor was, and I think it was his son, was operating out of an office there, at one time, when I was uptown barefoot, as we were barefoot all summer long, I stubbed my toe on the concrete curbing, which is an easy thing to do, and it turns the nail back, and it bleeds, and it hurts. And here I am crying, because I was very young, and two fine ladies, I never did get their names, took me up to Dr. Battershaw, who was the, the, the doctor at that time, and without any charge or showing any medical papers or even proving that I was born and lived in Attleboro, he wrapped up my toe. The, uh, one of the things that the kids used to do was amuse themselves. They didn't have a recreation department, they didn't have a field, but anyone that had a field was their field to field. <laughs> and it was, no one cared because if it's not being used, why not let it be used if not abused? And, and that's the way the thing went. They always picked up the best players first. And <laughs> there was always the one that's the last one to be picked. And he knew what chance he had to get on the team, so he had to grow up and become mayor of Attleboro. <laughs> well, the, the, uh, the kids had, I believe, more fun with a five-pound sugar bag filled with rags instead of a first-quality football and playing with their own rules and, and no equipment but their skins that didn't stand up too well in the encounters. There are many places now on the corner of Brook Street, Holman Street, there are trees that are practically as big as this tree that had no trees on them when we were kids and that's where we played. And the strange part of it is, after all these years, that still has trees there. And at one time, I believed it belonged to the Ashley Company that had the lumber yard. And where the Ashley lumber yard was is now a medical building. These changes come about. 
the Attleboro uptown residents were in the way of the development of business use buildings. So on 16 Brook Street, where I was born, I sure as am here that that was owned by the Holman family uptown that was moved down to 16 Brook Street uh, and, uh, and my family lived in it and paid rent to Holman for years and years and years. And finally, when they bought it, they found that the house had been put not only on the land that Holman owned, but the back end of it on the neighbor's land. And back in time, and Henry gave my family a warranty deed that everything was okay. And it went on and on until Money Cook Funeral Home thought they needed more parking. Now, next to 16 Brook Street was an, an empty lot that stands in back of the building on the corner of Brook Street and Park Street and next to the Money Cook Funeral Home at that time. And when they bought it, they ran into trouble with a man that owned the property on Emory Street that went back to the back of the property where I was born and found that a little skinny sliver, like a piece of cheese, was on their land and they made a big stink about it. And I was a member of the planning board at the time <laughs> and got a call. And this was after my family had moved from there, you know. And uh, he complained to me because that was illegally sitting on his land. And he being a Catholic, I said, now, you know, you go to church, don't you? Yeah. Well, you're supposed to be kind to your neighbors. So be neighborly. But he never got to be neighborly. Another thing of, of that same content was when 95 was going through and the Jehovah Witnesses were sure that it was going to wipe out their new temple. So the good elders and whatever they call their speaking people came to the planning board office and said, we are, think that the, the 95 will wipe us out and take our temple. I told them, have faith. <laughs> <laughs> well, it worked. It worked. I evidently had faith because it's still there. And 95 goes by. Well, the interesting part of that is that the house that I was born in, you know, had to move to get where it was. And the house that I went into on Parker Street near the corner of East Street I found had been moved, and at one time it was an undertaker's coffin display place that had a dome ceiling plastered, and they moved that house, and I almost think the name of the person that owned it was Mason because he owned all the houses around there. and. They moved it there and raised it up and created a new first floor. And above the ceiling of the second floor, you can get up above it. And there above the rafters of the first floor and ceiling is the dome ceiling plastic. And over the front window, there are two boards hanging down and a round log is suspended between them with pivots on the end, and, and they put a rope around that to haul the coffins up into this flavor. And I've been living there all this time. <laughs> well, the uh, first settler of Attleboro was William Blackstone. And they call it also B-L-A-X-T-O-N, and he settled in Shawmut, which was the Indian name for Boston when he came there. And he was one of the first settlers in Boston and had quite a holding of land because, you know, land was plentiful 
and what you got hold of was as big a piece as you could get. But he was a minister and had left England, if it was in England that he left, over in Europe someplace anyway, because he didn't get along with other religious faiths. They were bigoted, or he was bigoted, or they both were bigoted. And he came and settled there. And after he had settled, they call it uh, Blackstone's Neck, because at that time it was a neck of land that went out into the water, and part of it was what is now the Boston Common. And when the new settlers came in that gave him trouble, he decided to sell out and sold uh, his property to a group of people that paid him like $30 a piece. And he went with his cattle all the way to where Ann and Hope Mill Outlet is in Cumberland. And that was part of Attleboro one time because Attleboro just spread out as far as you could get without caring whose land it was on. And uh, all you had to do was draw a map and claim it. Attleboro did become part of, of uh, Rehoboth. And when they first established the, the uh, township, they were under the offices of Rehoboth. Now, it was something you were bound to do is to go to church. And, and the churches were connected with government at that time. And there being no church in Attleboro at that time, they had to go to a church in Rehoboth. And they not only had the obligation of taking care of their own dirt roads, you know how a dirt road has to be cared for, but they also had to help take care of the roads in Rehoboth because they were a part of Rehoboth. And when they formed their government as a town, the first thing they did was establish tax collector. <laughs> Naturally. And, uh, at first, they paid the taxes and, and were under the jurisdiction of policing the village in Rehoboth before they established themselves as a town. The, uh, where the common is today, now changed to the Veterans Common, it was a gift to the city as a common use for the people in Attleboro. Uh, and they called themselves Attleboro, as you know, from the town of Attleboro that they came from. And I like the way North Attleboro is still O-U-G-H, because it makes you clear your stomach, you know? <laughs> but we have our trouble with our stomach uh, with ending it with an O, oh my stomach. The, uh, but, you know, we've saved thousands of dollars by not adding UGH in time, ink. It's amazing how much money we've saved. <laughs> now, you know, one time when Tom Pickett was mayor, he was toying around with the idea of getting North Alba to join Alba as one city. But he didn't get any further in his office with that. <laughs> and another thing that John Pickett did that not many people know about, he had nomination papers for President of the United States. <laughs> and they never got filed, and I've got a copy of his nomination papers. <laughs> oh, wherever they are, wherever they are. And he's probably forgotten about it because he might have gone to a beer and pretzel party at the time it happened, you know? <laughs> and you don't remember things <laughs> when you've been around. One of the interesting things that, that I attended the synagogue representing the city because Tom Piggott came to me after a zoning board meeting and said, someone has got to go to the synagogue over on Pearl Street. You remember when the synagogue was on Pearl Street? And I was quite friendly with the, the Jewish establishment at that time. Uh, and uh, what did they do but put me down in the front row? 
<laughs> and one of the industrialists told me everything that was going on, you know, when things were happening, this is what's going. When they came for a collection, the only thing I had to my being was a $10 bill. <laughs> what? I'm down front. What am I going to do? Shake hands with the guy in the basket? I put the $10. <laughs> They don't even know about that, wherever it went. They don't even know. But, you know, the things that you do will, will get you somewhere later on, I hope. So the, uh, it, it, was, it was very thrilling to be part of that congregation at that time, to know how these people were so much in fact of their homeland. But they were Americans from the word go and would stay in America. I think only the young people went back and, and developed their orange groves and whatever else. The uh, Attleboro is still growing and uh, we're trying to get closer to the river now. And uh, if <laughs> If I was a developer, I'd like to have a little place alongside the river. But uh, there are more people concerned about the little polywogs than they are about people who would like to have their own log cabin. But that's the way people are, and we have to respect that. Uh, and we have to honor those people that are trying to save nature. Because without nature, we wouldn't be good nature. <laughs> one, of the, one of the things that, that comes to my mind uh, is the uh, Indians, when they came here, they would come all the way from Narragansett Bay, and they didn't invent the wheel. They had drag uh, poles. And who was pulling the drag poles? The squaws were pulling the drag poles. And they would take whatever was easy to carry and uh, necessary when they got here for the winter in the, the uh, wooded section where they got protection. And they had no water. They would go down to the Ten Mile River. That's why they always selected a place near river. They could fish and, and uh, catch game that lived along the river. And one of the things that they did was to uh, shoot a deer. Now we would think, oh boy, them great marksmen, aren't they? They weren't great marksmen, but they were sneaky people. <laughs> and they could sneak up close to a deer and couldn't miss them because they, they had to eat. Another thing that comes to mind is when the settlers begin to fence in and keep cattle, this was much easier to go in and shoot a cow <laughs> with your bow and arrow than it was to chase after a deer. And, and that was one of the things that bothered the settlers. <laughs> there were so many things going on. Now, when they came here, they didn't have uh, these stores and, and supply places, beauty shops and all, they just let their hair grow. And especially in the winter time. Nothing is more comforting than hair over your ears in the winter time. <laughs> Believe me. They, uh, and they found that most people tried to go their own way until, well, they made their own shoes, whatever fashion they came. <laughs> until some smart guy, like Silman showed him some real good shoes. <laughs> and uh, then instead of making their own, they went to the shoemaker. And one of the stories they tell is, is about the first jewelry manufacturer. And they only knew him as the Frenchman. And I didn't think that that was too unusual, because I worked in 21 years in Engelhardt's jewelry place, and some guys were only known as the Greek 
<laughs> Never found out what his name was. The only one that knew his name was the one that had to put his name on his payroll. So it, it was a, a common thing then and a common thing now. And those that are diligent in checking out on who the Frenchman was, they said that he died in poverty. And I said, nobody in Attleboro that had a jewelry factory ever died in poverty. His workers did. <laughs> so that, that went out the window. That went out the window. But the, uh, the fact is that the people who settled had a rough time of it. They didn't have glass in, in their windows because there wasn't plentiful there. And they used parchment that was oiled. And if you oil a parchment, it gets opaque, or whatever the name is, and some light will shine through. One of the things that I remember so well in the house I was born in on Brook Street was that the stairway up to the second floor bedroom was as steep as a ladder would be against a wall to get up into the loft. Now that's the way they established their sleeping quarters by having a loft with a ladder going up to it. And when they got smart enough to make stairs, they made it at the same pitch as the ladder. And my mother, when, the day before I was born, took an iron bedstead, as they called them in those days, and took it down those steep stairs, put it in the parlor, and I was born in the parlor. You see, they were smart, you know. How could anyone become illustrious unless they were born in the parlor? I ask you. And another thing we had at 16 Brook Street was gas lights. And they had something made uh, oh, so, oh well, I, I forget what it may have but it was like a globe as my father called it and it would hook up into the, the uh, gas fixture affording you light and when you first lit that globe it would burn with a brilliancy, and then it was just ashes held together by whatever holds your ashes together. And when we'd be upstairs, jumping out of bed or whatever we were doing, chasing around, my father would holler up, be quiet up there, you'll break the mantle. <laughs> and and uh, it, it was interesting. We uh, had the kerosene lamps where we didn't have enough illumination for the gas lights. And uh, it's, it's quite a thing to think of how gas has lasted as illumination and heating over the, all these years. It hasn't changed. And some people swear by that rather than electricity that goes out every time they have a thunderstorm. <laughs> Is there anything that anyone would like to talk about that uh, I might know something about? I would be very happy to tell them. I could tell you about school with the teachers all being women, unmarried women, unsullied. <laughs> What a, what, and they were like mothers to the kids. And, and they, I can remember Miss Gaffney. What I did, I don't know, and probably I didn't do it. But she had me out in the hall by my chin and lifted me up on my tiptoes while she talked to me and told me, whatever I did, don't do it again. And I didn't either. <laughs> the, uh, they talk about Mr. Studley. And, and Studley was a man of his own. He helped immigrants come to learn how to speak English and become American citizens. He did that on his own. He had clubs like the 
radio club and the photography club where he would have the kids. He sold us penny pictures of uh, different art uh, subjects that were, you know, really important pictures for a penny apiece. And he would come around to the, the classrooms to, to sell them. You don't see the superintendent uh, <laughs> without doing that anymore. And, and I think the price has gone up. Too. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> but the, uh, it, it was, I, I think that's where, you know, when they, they uh, established that the Mr. Studley had a razor strap, and they call it also a strop, S-T-R-O-P. And he had it hanging on the doorknob of the inside of the door of his office. And if you went in there and he closed that door, here's <laughs> the razor, razor strap saying, you better not do something that wasn't right because he would lay it on you. And I think they made a mistake when they stopped giving teachers the right to chastise. Uh, but uh, I've seen no respect for teachers, which we had in those days. My daughter went to Salem State to become a teacher. And when she went as a substitute teacher, she got no respect from the pupils, so she never taught school again. No respect. But she did have two daughters that are all A students and now in college. So it wasn't wasted because she used it on her kids. The, uh, I'll tell you uh, what comes to my mind right at this minute. It's 38 miles to Plymouth from Attleboro. Now, when the Indians were bothering the, the uh, settlers here in Attleboro, someone had to go to Plymouth, 38 miles, and tell them, send the troops down. Now, Captain Miles Standish was the captain of the troops, and, and uh, Thomas Willett became the captain of the troops after Miles Standish. That's something we don't learn about because the first one is the important one. Whoever comes after that is just another one. <laughs> <laughs> and they had to come fully loaded for warfare all the way from Plymouth on foot. But the Indians, they used to run when they went to war. Well, they didn't have any pants on anyway, so they had to run. <laughs> and, and, and they carried everything. One thing that, that I learned was that when the Indians, pregnant Indians, bore a child while they were on a journey, the whole troop kept going and they stood back and had their child and ran along to catch up with them. And that's enough to make you shake your head, isn't it? <laughs> but that's the kind of people they were. And, and uh, the Indians played a good part in shaping the lives of the pilgrims as they came here. And even when Attleboro was a town first, they had law against anyone that would harbor an Indian who was drunk. And what would they do? Put him up in a common, stick his head and his hands in there for a period of time, and people would go and spit on him. They had no cuspidors in those days. <laughs> now, we're too easy, as the sheriff knows, with prisoners today, because they will actually, they is one I have in mind from Alboro, that would commit a crime, a minor crime, but you know, enough so that he'd be sent down for the winter to the correctional institution where he was kingpin there. And he was a smart guy. He was smart enough to use it the wrong way. 
Yeah, and we've had a lot of smart people. Uh, I think that, that uh, Cy Brennan is, is one that I would look to and respect. He got, I, I think he got $3,000 a year pay. I'm not sure enough, but I think it was. three. And I've seen him, when someone came in that needed a handout, take a half a dollar from the last one in his pocket and give it to them. And that's the kind of a guy. There are not too many uh, people like Cy Brennan, so it must be lonely where he is. Because <laughs> he's got to be in a special place. So there are so many other things that have happened since I came to Attleboro. And I say that Dr. Elmo Lake is the one that delivered me in my house. But my family had lived in a row house where the post office that the city of Attleboro now owns existed. And next to the place my family lived was a family named Oliver. And Matt Oliver ran a fish market on Pleasant Street that's now part of the office, whatever you do in that office, drinking and carrying on. <laughs> the, the, uh, Matt Oliver's wife was called Nett Oliver, Jeanette, and she was my godmother. So whenever I wanted to go to the Bates Theater that cost a dime at that time, I could go down to Stocky Avenue and visit with my godmother and always come out with a dime. <laughs> <laughs> And she knew why I was there, you know. The, uh, they used to have a clam bake set up on Stocky Avenue next to Oliver's home, next to what is now Seidelcraft, I think is what they call it. And uh, my mother waited on tables there, and I helped by washing dishes. And so help me, when you had the chowder, dishes back, the, the water you were washing was more like, like clam chowder than clean water. <laughs> you could have sold it for chowder. Uh, and, and that was an unusual thing that was very popular. They built that place, they had a tent covering, and uh, it must have been probably 45 feet long with many tables and, and benches. They, uh, Matt Oliver also had a friend, Jim Leadham. And old Jim Leadham ran against Mayor Sweet when he first ran as the first mayor in 1914. And Jim Leadham was a loud mouth lawyer. And his wife, Flo, and if her name was Paul Flo, she might have been Florence or something like that. And they were very good friends of Matt Oliver's wife, Matt Oliver. And they, they had, Oliver had a playing piano. So all you had to do was sit in front of it and work your feet and roll around and you were like a champion player. The, uh, there was a picture of, of uh, Jim Leadham with, I think it was a Stanley Steamer. And the uh, Jim Leadham Jr., his son, was sitting out over what would be the radiator. But it didn't have a radiator because it had a fire, wood burning fire in the back. And that fire would heat water and produce steam that would make the wheels go around. And uh, I think we've seen that picture in the Sun Chronicle where uh, Jim Hannon, you know, shows what happened while Attleboro was growing up. Well, the biggest thing that ever happened in Attleboro is when the Attleboro Historic Preservation Society was formed. <laughs> and 
with that, uh, we'll leave that or get to get illumination. <laughs> uh, we're going to call it to a close. But if there's anything that Ralph Sears wants to know, he generally asks me. And even if I don't know, I tell him. <laughs> so it's been my pleasure to be here. I've been the town crier for 26 years now, and I cannot remember how I come to be a town crier. <laughs> so that's a true fact. And I'd like to have you know that I had a suit made during the bicentennial of the country. And so help me, I'd look like George Washington, only a little better. <laughs> and uh, I wore it in almost every parade that they would put me in. And the, under the arms it was worn. And I didn't notice it any more than George would because he didn't, you know, he didn't have a tailor. And uh, Kay Shang said, you've got to have a new suit. Wow. I said, this, I like this one. It's all right. Yeah, but look at it. It's all tattered and torn. He took me in his truck for 12 hours to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. <laughs> we stayed overnight. And I think he did this just to be able to go and all the way eating junk food. <laughs> <laughs> the only way, you know, you can get away with it. And uh, we went and stayed in the motel during the night and in the morning early we went to breakfast and then went to squirrel hill and there were two uh, young maybe in their 20s and an old, an older one in their 40s measured me for the suit and the interesting part of it was that the young one measured my head and my shoulders, my arms and whatever. But when it came to the inseam, she turned it over to the younger one, the older one. And, and uh, I said, do it again just to be sure. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he paid $750 for this outfit with the great coat that I couldn't bear to put on tonight. And it took months before it came, and they never did give me the hat. And this hat I made myself like the early settlers put it back to. <laughs> and my wife, this is an ostrich feather that my wife pulled out of an ostrich. <laughs> so, so without any more to do, I uh, say there's no lights to turn on, and... Uh, we got to get these chairs back. Larry, could you tell us a little bit about the Bates Opera House? I'll tell you about the Bates Opera House. Down near the Bungi River, there's a dump. And the dump went from North Main Street as far on Holden Street as the Bungi River. Then Keep on that street and you become on Stocky Avenue, which only came as far as wherever it ends. Now that's unusual. That here's two, two different names on the same street that you don't get off of. But being near a wetlands, they had a common dump there. And I was digging bottles and found a red asbestos curtain. You know how, the, how big the stage is. And this asbestos curtain was so heavy, you know, the, the, the thread of asbestos woven together. And it had a dye, a red dye on it. And the pulley arrangement that ran along on iron posts or poles, the, the wheels of the pulley, would be pulled and, and open that up. And it must have weighed an awful lot. But a, a lot of that asbestos curtain is still buried in the ground next to uh, Holden Street. And uh, I found many, many uh, interesting items there. One, I used to go early in the morning before work 
and uh, I dug a hole. And as much as a, a shovel, you know, the shot handle shovel, would allow it to be dug. And I thought, here I come all this time, up early, haven't got anything. Just as I thought that, out of the side of this hole, a cascade of, I think they were forks, I don't think they were spoons, came down and laid out like that in a fan. And I thought, well, whoever is looking after the, the bottle diggers <laughs> certainly took care of me that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, they had been in the ground so long that uh, just by being out in the regular atmosphere, the, the fork part broke off from the handle just in the vibration going home. But uh, I'll tell you an interesting thing that happened. A friend of mine that really got me into baking bottles went over to the hill off County Street opposite the Bigany building on Wall Street, which you know in back of the store there, there's a hill. And people used to throw their rubbish over the hill. And this young fellow dug there and got a bottle that they call green glass. But if you hold it, uh, black glass they call it, if you hold it up to a light, you see it's green. But it looks just like blood. And it was uh, four square and it had the, in the raised letter Indian Panacea. Now you know what that is. You never use it. <laughs> he showed that at the Rhode Island Little Rhodey Bottle Club, and a fellow offered him, I think, like $500. He said, no. The next week, that fellow came to his house and offered him $1,000. He said, no. He sent it to an auction house in New York, got $3,400 for it, and the $400 was the claim for the auctioneer company. And I've been looking for <laughs> But I have a bottle that has the inscription on it, raised letters, snake oil. And that reminds me of a family named Crosson. Now, cross on with Negro family on uh, Pike Avenue next to Bearcroft Railroad, just across the track from it. And he used to make cross on pile side. If you had a pile, oh. buy cross on. Oh. <laughs> and 25 it was, my old telephone that you had to use two hands with, there was this lady that would call, and evidently Crosson number was close to ours, and when I was answered, she'd say, Miss Crosson? <laughs> and then you got the wrong number. And more than once I got that. But I know for sure that part of the preparation of Crosson pile saw was skunk oil, because wow. I tried skunk oil. Not that I tried it on piles or anything, but I did. <laughs> trying it means you, you, you like fry it. You know, if you fry bacon, you get a lot of fat. And this fat will congeal into a white uh, lard substance. And that's good for whatever you put it on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think I bored you enough tonight. It's talk about the base the Bates Theater. Tell them what it looked like. I remember. Well, I never saw the Bates Theater with the asbestos curtain, but I acted on the stage of the Bates Theater as a ballerina with a little. Oh, ballerina. <laughs> and I had the army shoes from World War One that they had repaired and issued to the State Guard when we were formed in Alvor. And it was the State Guard Follies that I was in. And I, <laughs> I, I 
Whatever that song is, it's just great for doing it, you know? Well, I, I did it on my tippy toes, too. And, and uh, naturally, the picture was on the front page of the sun. <laughs> and uh, then I took a handkerchief and I put it down in the back of me and, and <laughs> did this. <laughs> Have you given that picture to. Uh, I don't know where that picture is. Oh. In the archives, someplace. But the uh, Bates Theater was, uh, the dressing rooms were like made of bond boards. There was nothing fancy about them. And uh, we had put on the show at the Bates Theater. Uh, Sam Fine was one of them. And, and one of the, the part that I was in, I had to hold a plate up and the curtain was here in back of me. And Sam Fine was up in the, in the balcony with a regular uh, rifle, with a blank gun, blank cartridge. And when he would shoot, I had the other hand in the back of the grip and I would break. <laughs> 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 well, here's another time he's going to do it again. I'm holding up there, <laughs> bang, nothing, delay shot. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, they were good, they were good. I was a member of the Phi Sepa Club, and the Phi Sepa was made from nationalities, I believe, French, Italian, Spanish, Portuguese, American, Phi Sepa. That might not be accurate, but that's the idea of the thing. And I was the only male on a busload of girls that uh, went uh, to the camps down the Cape and put on a show for them. I was their master of ceremonies. And somehow or other, Frank Sinatra was in his fame at that time. So they had bought me a sport coat and uh, whatever else I needed to be Frank Sinatra. And I sang one of the songs. Won't you tell me when we may meet again, now, forever, when? <laughs> and the audience would scream like yeah. the girls did. <laughs> so, so I've had my time. But the, uh, the state guard was ready to go. And that's one thing that was wrong with many of boys just out of high school that didn't have sufficient training enough to know how to protect themselves. And they you had a chance of being killed because they weren't able to protect. We were ready to be called, trained. Uh, we used to stay in the armory one night a week and in your turn and call the police department to let them know that all was secure that the Germans hadn't brought paratroopers over, landed nearby, and got their arms from the army. They really believed that was going to happen. So, <laughs> it took you long enough. <laughs>